So often, I think in mathematics, some of the most uh, beautiful and interesting results are found by taking a mathematical object and viewing it from a variety of different mathematical perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the case for um, the so-called Laplacian paradigm in the field of algebra. So the idea behind this is that you have an undirected graph, and you can, of course, just view it as a graph, but you can also view it as a reversible Markov chain, so by looking at like random walks on the graph, or as a matrix called a Laplacian matrix, which is just defined as the diagonal matrix of degrees minus the uh, adjacency matrix or transpose of the adjacency matrix uh, in the directed case, but we'll get to that later, um, A. And uh, also um, another interpretation, right? It's the right-hand side of the heat equation. So like, why, why do we do care about these matrices? Because it's a discretization of the, the heat equation is one reason, but there are other reasons too. So through exploiting these connections between these three different perspectives, people have been able to find nearly linear time algorithms for solving a variety of problems in each of these different perspectives. So for example, in the linear algebraic setting, uh, you can of course find the kernel of L, it's just the all ones vector, that's something you can check. Um, but more difficultly, you can solve a Laplacian linear system, Lx equals v in nearly linear time, and do a lot of other interesting linear algebraic things as well. When you say linear time, it's in the number of vertices for a sparse graph? Um, so nearly linear time in the, no in the number of edges. So in a sparse graph, that would be in the number of vertices. But more generally, like in a dense graph, it's about the time it takes to write, like, to write down the graph on a piece of paper. Um, so then uh, if from in the reversible Markov chain setting, you can do things like compute the hitting times between vertices, approximate the mixing time, and uh, compute the stationary distribution. Uh, that last one is easy, uh, just because it's proportional to the degrees in the graph, all in nearly linear time. And finally, um, some other problems, like in the field of combinatorial algorithms, include things like approximating max flow, uh, balanced partitioning of graphs, and computing random span trees, again, all in nearly linear time. And so this has been very successful for undirected graphs, but a natural question arises whether you can generalize this to directed graphs, sort of get a directed version of the Laplacian paradigm. So what would that look like, right? So now you have a directed graph. You can still view a directed graph as a Markov chain just by doing a random walk on the graph. And then you can define a directed analog of the Laplacian matrix, which is defined now as the diagonal matrix of out degrees minus the transpose of the adjacency matrix. And again, you can ask all these same questions that you asked on undirected graphs on directed graphs. And in particular, I want to draw your attention oh, and you know, whether you can do them in nearly linear time. So in particular, I want to draw your attention to uh, these two problems that were easy for undirected graphs, uh, computing the stationary distribution of a random walk on an undirected graph, or finding the kernel of the Laplacian matrix of an undirected graph. So for undirected graphs, these problems are just very easy. You can just read it off the graph. But in the directed setting, uh, they're, they're much harder. And in fact, um, prior to our work, uh, there was no algorithm for computing these things faster than general purpose matrix multiplication um, or uh, poorly conditioned graphs. And furthermore, um, in the combinatorial algorithm setting, all of the known algorithms, um, at least for these problems, were uh, worse than linear by a polynomial factor. And uh, so what we do is uh, we show that for two of these three things, uh, you can get nearly linear time and the number of uh, edges and vertices. And an interesting feature question is you know, whether you can use this to uh, also solve some of these combinatorial problems faster. So now I'm gonna talk about sort of a little bit of how we did it. Obviously there's not enough time to go into you know, great detail. Um, but first I wanna talk about Eulerian graphs. So a graph is Eulerian if the weighted in degree of each vertex is equal to the weighted out degree of each vertex. So here we have a vertex uh, V it has a weighted in degree one plus two plus two is five. Weighted out degree three plus one plus one is also five. And if, it, and if it's the case that the in degree is equal to the out degree weighted for every single vertex, not just B, then we call the graph Eulerian. And uh, so one of the things we show is that you can reduce the general case for our arbitrary graphs to the case where the graph is Eulerian via this sort of iterative reduction where you, um, that we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And uh, then we show that you can quickly solve directed Laplacian systems where the graph is an Eulerian graph. And in order to do that, we leverage uh, something called the sparsification algorithm um, for Eulerian graphs that's fast. So I'm now gonna talk just briefly about the reduction to the Eulerian case, not in any great detail. Uh, so basically the idea is this. So let's say that you have an approximate stationary distribution 
It turns out that if you have an approximate stationary distribution, this lets you take random walks quickly. And in particular, the length of the random walks depends on the quality of the approximation to the stationary distribution. And in order to do this, you need to use an Eulerian Laplacian uh, linear system solver. That's why we need that. Um, so you can take, so you have an approximate stationary distribution, you take some random walks. And then from taking those random walks, you can get a better approximate stationary distribution. And what this lets you do is essentially double the length of the walks that you can take each time. So basically, in sort of log-ish applications of an Eulerian Laplacian system solver, you can actually solve Laplacian linear systems for general graphs. I realize that this is not like rigorous, just sort of the flavor of how it works. I'm now going to talk about, uh, I've spent pretty much the rest of the talk talking about sparsification, which is an important tool that's used in the Eulerian Laplacian uh, system solver that we have. So what is sparsification? A sparsification procedure takes a graph H and outputs a graph H prime, such that H prime is sparse, and the directed Laplacian matrices of H and H prime approximate each other in an appropriate linear algebraic sense that we'll talk about in more detail if we have enough time. And we call H prime a sparsifier of H. So, so if you're familiar with like um, the loner ordering for, and for, um, for symmetric matrices, uh, this would correspond basically to saying that like matrices approximate each other within like you know, a constant factor or something under the loader ordering in the symmetric case. Now we're dealing with asymmetric matrices, so obviously we're going to need something uh, different from that. On, um, for undirected graphs, this problem of sparsification is easy. So there's an algorithm, uh, well, I, I say easy. There was a long line of work that it took to make it easy, but now it's easy. Uh, so there's an algorithm of Spielman and Troop Saba from 2008, and it lets you um, essentially you know, take an undirected graph and then output a new graph whether the edges are combinatorially a subset of the edges in the original graph, but where the weights are potentially different, which approximates the original graph into sparse. And so what it does is it computes some special number for each undirected edge called the leverage score, and then samples a bunch of undirected edges with probability proportional to these numbers. So it's basically just important sampling, essentially. And you, you can show this that with high probability, this approximates the original graph and that you don't need to take too many samples. So you get the sparse graph. You have to change the weights, did you say? Yeah, it's an important sampling. You need to like calculate the weights, and that, that's like non-trivial as well. So on directed graphs, uh, sparsification is uh, hard, or at least harder than the undirected case. Uh, so one thing you could try to do is sort of an analog of the undirected algorithm, where you try to compute some probability of each directed edge and sample a bunch of directed edge according to these kinds of uh, probabilities. But unfortunately, an approach like that just won't, like no approach along those lines will work unlike the directed, uh, an undirected case. So uh, here's an example, just uh, consider the undirected cycle. So, you know, if, you, if we were to sample pairs of directed edges in each direction, so just treating it as an undirected graph, sampling works. But if we treat it as a directed graph instead, so we're considering each directed edge individually, then it, uh, it does not work. Because in particular, like what will happen is that you'll wind up with different weights in each direction along the graph. And you might think maybe it's okay, but the problem is that, like, we, have, we haven't said, right, what the notion of approximation that we're talking about is. But if you just sort of heuristically think, like, what kinds of properties should a good notion of approximation have, then what you can see is that, like, changing the, perturbing the weights of the edges will pretty much ruin anything reasonable you think of. So um, in particular, uh, from a combinatorial perspective, the graph is no longer Eulerian. From a random walks perspective, it can greatly change the stationary distribution and greatly change the commute times. And from a linear algebraic perspective, again, the kernel of L uh, changes a lot. And it's a polynomially bad preconditioner for the original graph. So basically, like whatever properties you want approximation to have, this shows that like this kind of approach will not preserve those properties. So this is not the right approach to take. Oh, and these first uh, bullet points are all equivalent. OK, so that takes us to uh, what, what actually does work. So the first idea is that we want to uh, preserve Eulerianness explicitly. So this, uh, we mentioned, right, that um, the stationary distribution of the graph could change a lot. Eulerian graphs have a known stationary distribution. It's just proportional to degrees, just like in the undirected case. So if we preserve Eulerianness explicitly, we're explicitly preserving the stationary distribution. That at least prevents one bad thing from happening. Um, so now that leads to a second algorithm attempt. We sample randomly, as before. But we add additional edges to the graph now to force it to be Eulerian. So this will forcibly preserve the stationary distribution. Unfortunately, there's still two problems with this. First, uh, we don't know what probabilities to sample with. And second, uh, the error from adding edges may be very large. 
And the way we get around that is by sparsifying expanders, which was also an approach that was sort of taken in the undirected case. So the idea is um, this. So remember the problems with that second attempt we had, right? We don't know what probabilities to sample with, and the patching can add too much error. So if the graph is an Eulerian expander, then sampling uni pretty much uniformly is OK. Really, you want to do something like proportional to degree, but just think uniformly. And any reasonable patching scheme you do is going to only add small error. And this is intuitively because expanders are sort of big. And so you can afford to actually make a lot of error on an expander. And you're still going to multiplicatively approximate things because your object that you're bounding your error with respect to is big. <laughs> And so, so that's one of the things we show that you, we can, in fact, sparsify uh, Eulerian expanders. But there's sort of a problem here, maybe you've, you've noticed, which is, um, oh, sorry, I, I should say the algorithm first before I say the problem with it, right? So the, al right, the algorithm, this leads to a third attempt at an algorithm, which is you decompose the graph into a bunch of Eulerian expanders. And then within each expander, you sort of uniformly sample directed edges and then patch the graph to explicitly force it to stay Eulerian. And this almost works, but the problem is that um, you can't always decompose an Eulerian graph into Eulerian expanders. I mean, just a simple, um, oh, did I not include that? Oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah. So just a simple example of this, right, is um, like consider this, uh, you know, graph, right? It's just an edge, right? Um, this graph, like, it's not even like, um, oh, sorry, I didn't include the example. I'm sorry. Sorry. The point is you, you can come up with graphs where you can't, like um, a complete bipartite graph would be an example, not, not, not the, what I have on this, on this slide. Oh, sorry, complete directed bipartite graph. So, um, but, so one of the things that we show is that instead of using uh, oil, oil graphs that are Eulerian expanders, that's sort of what we decomposed the graph into, we instead decompose the graph into graphs where if you erase the directions on the edges, it becomes an expander. So we're sort of bounding the error with respect to like the undirectification of the graph. And this actually uh, works. So you decompose the graph into subgraphs that would be expanders if we erased edge directions. Uh, there are several uh, algorithms for this that are known. And then with each subgraph, we uniformly sample the directed edges and then patch it to force it explicitly to stay Eulerian. And that does actually give a working sparsification algorithm. All right, so it looks like I have a little more time. So I, I want to talk about multiplicative approximation for matrices. So basically, we, we, right, we talked about, you know, approximation, but we didn't actually say what it was. So now I want to sort of talk about that a little bit more formally. So for the symmetric case, right, uh, we say that A is greater than or equal to zero under the loader ordering if uh, A is uh, if A is positive semi-definite. And more generally, right, that A is greater than or equal to C under the loader ordering if A minus C is greater than or equal to zero. If you don't know what the loader ordering is, uh, I apologize. Uh, Looks like I won't have time to go into that. So then we can talk about uh, like a gamma approximating C. And what that just means is that like they're within a gamma factor under the load order. And so if you think of these as just like positive numbers, it's just like being within a constant factor or something or for positive numbers. It's just generalized out of matrices, or I should say symmetric PSD matrices. And so uh, why do we care about this notion of approximation? Uh, because it reduces, because it allows you to given a linear system solver for either A or C, get a linear system solver for the other. So if I can solve AX equals B, then that allows me to solve CX prime equals uh, B prime or vice versa. Oh, and uh, yeah, so it's, a gamma, it's a gamma squared factor because you get a gamma from each side. And this has, this has several nice properties. Uh, first, you can add it. So if I have two matrices that approximate each other, and then another set of two matrices that approximate each other, I can add those approximation statements. And it behaves exactly like you would hope that you know you just add both sides and you get an approximation statement for the whole thing. And you can also do other things like conjugating it on uh, both sides by matrices, uh, inverting, and it has a limited amount of transitivity, um, as long as you're willing to sort of pay a gamma factor each time you invoke transitivity. And so it looks like I'm out of time now, but just briefly for the, um, for complex, basically what we do is we give something that for the special case of complex numbers gives you a way of talking about multiplicative approximation for complex numbers and then generalize this to matrices. And that sort of gives you a way of talking about asymmetric matrices approximating each other. And I think I'll, I'll end there.
Questions? Could you just go back to your previous slide about how you said so? So this 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 inequality. These are these are just positive definite now or not? Uh, these, so so this is just the symmet this, like the standard symmetric case. This isn't anything yeah, that yeah, that's not familiar. Yeah. yeah. And but so, and so these, are, these are these are the PS yeah loaner ordering inequalities. Yeah. Is that no? But but your new definition. I'm trying to understand. So uh, this just says that like A and C are within a gamma factor of each other, like under the loaner ordering. But but you're not are you, you're not assuming that they're positive definite or, or you are. Uh, so yeah, so, so 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 we do want to assume they're positive semi definite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's kind of like it's kind of hard to talk about like um like negative numbers like. Uh, yeah. No, but I th I thought. It's not that you're working in the, oh, this is the recap of symmetric case, but yeah. what, what are you doing in your case where it's not symmetric? Oh, yeah, so, yeah that's, 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 that's the part where I like, yeah, I, I didn't get to. Uh, so basically the idea is that um, if you have what, two uh, complex numbers, you, one of the ways you can think of multiplicative approximation is saying is that like their, their difference is small compared to like the magnitude of either of them. But this has sort of a drawback, which is that uh, you can't, it's not, it's not like the right-hand side isn't, isn't linear and you can't triangle inequality like the left-hand side. So you can't add approximation statements like you can in the symmetric case. So what we use actually instead is, is, small, is saying that the, like essentially the absolute value of their difference is small compared to their real part. Um, and this lets you add approximation statements, uh, which is very useful. Well, this is not the depth. This is, this is, this is, this is yeah, this is not, this is nothing yeah, new. This okay. is just like old. So you're stuff. using more of a norm kind of approximation now, is that right? Uh, the real part of the norm? Um, I mean, there are there are norms in the definition of the approximation uh, statement, but you can also write this with norms too if you want. Um, yeah, um, in Spielman, what I always liked is he implements everything. You implement your algorithm. No, you would you would not want to implement uh, like any of, of this stuff. Although I will say that uh, you asked about Spielman, he has actually taken one piece of our thing and, and used it not for the directed case, but for, for the undirected case, which is um, this idea of explicitly uh, like preserving the de degrees in the graph that we use. He's found that like you do get a little bit of an improvement if you use that idea in the undirected case. I don't think he's published anywhere. It's just some informal experiments uh, he did. But, um, but no, the, the, there are way too many logs and on this to like actually implement uh, this as it is. But hopefully that'll be improved in the future. Hey, thanks again.